A few steps more and a beautiful prairie suddenly opened to our view. An extended and irregular outline of wood, its varied surface interspersed with clumps of oaks of centuries growth. Its tall grass was seed stalks from six to 10 feet high, like tall and slender reed waving in a gentle breeze, the whole presenting a magnificence of park scenery, complete from the hand of nature. For once, the reality came up to the picture of the imagination. Well, Chicago Wilderness is about 200,000 acres of parks and preserves that preserve in their lands and waters some of the finest remaining examples of the native ecosystems of the Midwest. We have tall grass prairies here, and we have oak woodlands and savannas, and we have wetlands of various kinds that have almost vanished from the face of the earth. Here in the Chicago area, due to the foresight of uh, a number of people uh, and the, the eagerness of ordinary citizens to support systems like our forest preserves, uh, we have these beautiful lands and waters. Prairies were one of the most striking features of the Illinois landscape. Beautiful flowery meadows that stretch for miles. This was where Americans first encountered the wide open spaces, it was right here in Illinois. This is an oak savanna, an area where the prairie and the woodland meet. Wide-spreading, open-grown oak trees, a mixture of sunlight and of shade, supporting species of both the prairie and of the woodland. Today, savannas are rarer globally than even the most endangered rainforest, and some of the, the last occurrences are here in the Chicago region, in the six counties around the city. Wetlands are valuable for a couple of reasons. First thing is they act as a natural buffer for stormwater flow. When there is a large rainstorm in an urbanized area, the water hits the pavement and runs off essentially immediately and moves it downstream and can often cause some flooding problems for the people in those downstream areas. To a good extent, when we destroy natural wetlands or build up on them, we eliminate that living sponge that is a good wetland area that absorbs that and we pass the problem on down to our neighbors further downstream. In a natural area, you've got open soil and plants with lots of thirsty roots that act as a big sponge to take up a lot of that initial moisture and reduce the rate of flow into the creeks. A lot of people look at green areas in terms of lawns and think that those are the equivalent of a nice natural wetland area. Unfortunately, our Kentucky bluegrass lawn acts more like a green form of asphalt than a nice natural area. The, the roots are all very surface oriented and there's a lot of thatch on the surface that reduces the ability of the soil to absorb any of the moisture and that's why it doesn't really do a very good job of picking up the moisture and holding it the way a nice natural Illinois wetland does. Any new development that goes in must be obliged to maintain the rainwater on their own site as good or better than what was there before. It's a gloriously wonderful transformation of the landscape and we participate in that. We participate in it not by imposing our idea of the landscape on it, but by reading the possibilities of the landscape, seeing what this place can be, what it has been in the past, what it can be again, and taking the actions that are needed. And the actions are natural processes that we are initiating. 
unbelievable pictures. We have a brush fire that is out of control, according to Beach Park uh, Fire Department. Look at this. They tell us 100 acres currently burning here along the Lake Michigan shoreline, east of Sheridan Road, right around a cross street of Wadsworth or so. This is the Illinois Beach State Park, uh, which borders Lake Michigan here. We are still over this breaking news situation, a huge 100-acre brush fire in Illinois Beach State Park. That's a north suburban... This suspected arson fire, April 28th, in a protected area at Illinois Beach State Park near Zion, consumed some 500 acres. Now, at the time, it sounded disastrous. However, we went back to visit the burned area and found a few signs of fire and abundant evidence of new life. Fire removes a top layer of dead plants that would block the sunlight. Also, fire tends to stimulate some of the organisms in the ground, and they can decompose the nutrients more quickly and make the nutrients more readily available. From a conservationist point of perspective, it wasn't a disaster. Some of the news stories led with uh, 500 acres were destroyed at Illinois Beach State Park, and, and it kind of made me chuckle because the natural areas are going to do just fine. This ecosystem that we're looking at is maintained by the use of fire. It thrives after a fire. The fire uh, might have been set either by Indians or just natural lightning strikes, and it would have just ripped across this landscape. The critical component in all natural area work in Illinois is the reintroduction of fire. Uh, most of the Illinois landscape burned every couple years. In the case of prairie, what it did was remove the dead plant material that was on the ground and allow the soil to become bare in the sense of blackened, and that allows the sun to come down, warm the soil, and it gives the prairie plants a head start in the spring. Otherwise, that debris takes forever to decompose. This is such an incredible um, little wet prairie here on the right side with all the blazing star blooming and um, the big blue stem and Indian grass and uh, off in the background there we have some sawtooth sunflower. We've been burning regularly and as you pan left we're up into the shrubs that have just totally gotten out of hand and are so thick that there, wouldn't, there isn't anything left of the community you saw on the right side of the fire break. And there really isn't anything different between the right side and the left side other than fire has been used as a management tool periodically over the years. So fire is very important in maintaining our native species. We're trying to manage it for the most number of species that can utilize this area and that includes human beings. Now herbicides are something that I actually use only sparingly, but there are some situations where aggressive species that we humans have brought to the United States and that have escaped, we call them exotic pests, invade natural systems and the natural systems don't have any defense against them. So we need to come in and remove them. And in some cases, the best way to do that is using very sparingly an herbicide. We are very serious and we take great care with how we apply herbicides. We experiment with the lowest possible concentration of the active chemical that we can get away with and still have uh, good control. Given the, the problems that we face in terms of controlling the uh, non-native species that are coming into our preserves, there's no way we would hope to be able to um, manage a site and keep it looking like this without the occasional use of, of herbicides. The problem is, introduced species arrive, uh, we've often said, without their baggage. And as a result, there are no natural enemies that are capable of controlling them in their, in their new environment, in their new home. So uh, a, a problem pest in Europe or in Asia shows up in the US, but it has no disease, no predator, no parasite that can keep it under control. And if it finds this to be a suitable habitat, the populations can explode. Purple loosestrife is one of the most classic examples of a very aggressive 
non-native species. It's here without any natural pests in terms of insects that live off of it or microbes that uh, use it as a host. It does really, really well here and can completely take over an area and become the only plant of any significance in the wetland area. In doing so, it displaces all of the other things that are here and so all of the plants are lost and then once the plants are lost, the insects that relied on those plants are lost and then the birds that relied on those insects get lost and so uh, it really sets together the beginnings of a domino effect by displacing the plants. It ends up displacing the entire ecosystem. As you decrease the diversity of plant life, you also decrease the diversity of insects and birds and, and even mammals. Also, many of the animals that rely on native plants in wetlands uh, do not fare well, whether it's insects or uh, birds that are feeding on the insects in wetlands. Uh, it changes the, the composition of the wetland, too, and uh, ducks or waterfowl that used to nest in some of these aren't able to, uh, to use the areas anymore. Purple loosestripe may be a very attractive flower, but its effect can be quite devastating. Purple loosestrife came from Europe probably 200 years ago, and back in the 1980s there was search for uh, natural enemies of the plant in its native habitat in Europe. The purple loosestrife beetle is an introduction of one of those stressors from Europe and Asia. It is an insect that feeds on purple loosestrife almost exclusively. And where it's been reintroduced, the loosestrife has reduced in number from being the most obvious plant there. So we've actually had some degree of success with that particular species in bringing over one of its pests to bother it here. Unfortunately, this is what many people think of as our woodlands in northeastern Illinois. Uh, actually, it couldn't be any further from the truth. This is an area that's been abused. It's been overgrazed. So this is not a natural location. And although it looks vibrant, it's, it's really, uh, really unhealthy. The shrub layer formed a very dense uh, overstory. And what that has done is just really shaded out you know, most of the ground vegetation and so many of the associated insects birds and that that rely maybe on some of those plants aren't here. Today we're helping uh, open up a brushy area to allow more sunlight in. It's important to cut down buckthorn because it's a plant that has been brought in from Europe and tends to move in as a thick hedge-like shrub that shades out um, the native plants. Garlic mustard is invasive and it sort of kills everything else. It blocks the light from getting to other plants. Today we're pulling garlic mustard. Some days we chop buckthorn. We're trying to get all the invasive plants out of the way so that the native species have room to grow. When you, uh, when you begin removing the garlic mustard in areas like this, the native plants really do start to respond um, fairly quickly. I do see, besides the um, uh, blue-eyed Mary, there's some small patches of wild ginger, and, and we know that once we remove the garlic mustard, that will respond, and uh, we would have a, a pretty good ground cover of native plants, so that would be the, the goal in the management. Another set of species that we're really concerned about in terms of their impacts on water, water systems are a couple of species of Asian carp and they've had a very dramatic impact on river ecosystems, at least in certain habitats, where biologists have gone in and sampled certain habitats in the Mississippi River and found that 97% of the fish biomass there was Asian carp. And so that's really taken a big toll on the native fishes that are, are commonly there. The Asian big head carp. DNR officials so worried about carp infiltrating the lake, they are replacing this electric barrier along the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal with a $7 million one, all to keep them out. Well, invasive species cost us all money. The best estimate 
of a study done at Cornell was about $137 billion a year. So putting that into everyday terms, that costs every individual about $500 a year, every year, just for the cost from invasive species. So even though they may be pretty, if they're diminishing the quality of land or the value of it or killing trees that we have in our neighborhood or reducing the fisheries, they cost us all uh, money as well as uh, natural beauty. Today we're um, collecting seed. We collect seed throughout the growing season, take those seeds and process them, put them into mixes depending on the kind of community, the natural community that they grow in. It's kind of exciting to see the whole harvest in one place. And you know, as you can see, a lot of people working here very hard, but having a good time together, having lunch together, and, and uh, accomplishing a great thing for the prairie. We will then, once they've been mixed, give them back to the stewards and the stewards will take them to their sites and sow them, spread them around um, to restore those native plants as a part of the restoration activity. We want to spread them as widely as possible and get those plants established so that they can then begin to spread themselves around naturally. There's a wholeness to being in places like this. There's uh, a completeness that you can't get inside of a building. To me, the land itself is what has made us a people. And when I step into it, when I'm out working in it, uh, I feel a completeness that I can't find inside of a building or inside of an office. Um, we are, in a very real sense, an outdoor people. That's how our culture evolved. And uh, I find a connection to both the past and to the future as well by being out in it and working with it. I got into conservation because I would walk through the woods and prairies and I would see scenes like this and think nothing looked more beautiful. Um, to me, personally, it's almost like a spiritual experience. I mean, you feel like you're seeing something authentic and you're seeing something that um, is incredibly special and there's a sense of, of peace, of tranquility. You kind of get re-centered. I look at this and I want to sit down and say, this is just incredible. I mean, this is beautiful. Studies over and over again have proved the value of outdoor experiences um, for the mental and physical health of people and landscapes like this will nurture our souls as well as provide thriving habitat for many endangered and threatened species. To see sandhill cranes among oak trees is, is remarkable. Historically, this is where they occurred as well as in the open prairies nearby. Um, the trees are widely spaced enough, there's enough open ground here, enough wetlands. It, it's good for my heart and soul. I truly believe that some of these oak trees some of the genetic makeup of these cranes existed 8,000 years ago. And what we're seeing is, is that picture. The same plants, the same animals. And it's exciting to know that we're giving it the stewardship that it takes to perpetuate it. We're expanding it through restorations. I think people just have to think more about like where they're going to build their things and how they can you know, make sure that they don't harm the environment when they're, you know, building new houses or, or st other structures. Because, um, I mean, there's, there's ways that you can coexist with nature in, like, a healthy way, and people just need to, you know, think about it and be careful what they do, so it's all balanced.